our earlier discussion outlined the following points number 1 the right course for man is to live in obedience to god and for the observance of such a life knowledge and faith are absolutely essential it means one must have knowledge about god and his special attributes his likes and dislikes and one must know his chosen way and the inevitability of the day of judgment then there must be unflinching faith in the truthfulness of this knowledge this is iman faith number 2 god has graciously spared man the difficult task of acquiring this knowledge through his own effort alone he has not put man to this difficult trial instead he revealed the way to the prophets he commanded them to convey the will of god to the people and show them the right path this has saved man from tremendous anguish and adversity number 3 the duty of all men and women is to recognize the prophet and follow in his footsteps this is the road to salvation now we will discuss the nature history and aspects of prophethood <laughs> prophethood its nature and necessity you can see that god was so kind and generous that he provided in this universe everything which man needs every newborn child arrives in the world gifted with eyes to see ears to hear a nose to smell and breathe hands to touch feet to walk and a mind to think and reflect everything that a man needs all the necessary abilities and resources are provided marvelously set into his tiny body each and every minute requirement is foreseen and provided for nothing which he needs is left out the same is true for the world in which he lives everything essential for his life is provided in abundance air light heat water and so on the child upon opening his eyes finds food in his mother's breast his parents have an instinctive love for him and in their hearts has been implanted an irresistible urge to look after him to bring him up and to sacrifice their all for his welfare under the sheltering care of the sustaining system which surrounds him the child grows to maturity and can obtain the things he needs at every stage of his growth in fact all the material conditions needed for survival and growth are provided for and he finds that the whole universe is at his service at every turn this is not all man is blessed with all those potentials and abilities physical mental and moral which he requires for his struggle for life here god has made a wonderful arrangement he has not distributed these gifts to man strictly equally their equal distribution would have made men totally independent of one another and impaired the possibilities of mutual care and cooperation even though mankind on the whole possesses all that is needed yet among men qualities and abilities are distributed unequally and sparingly some possess physical strength and athletic ability others are noted for their mental talents some are born with greater talents for art poetry and philosophy while others possess military skill keenness scientific curiosity literary observation etc these special talents make a man distinct and give him the ability to grasp those complex concepts which elude the grip of most individuals these intuitions and talents are gifts from god they are found naturally contained within those individuals who have been so distinguished by god careful reflection upon this arrangement of god's gift also reveals that the talents have been distributed among men in a marvelous way capacities which are essential for the general maintenance of human culture have been given to most human beings while those extraordinary talents which are required on a limited scale are given only to a few the number of soldiers farmers craftsmen and laborers is large but military generals scholars statesmen and intellectuals are comparatively few the same is true with all professions arts and sciences the general rule seems to be the higher the capacity and greater the genius the lesser the number of people who possess them 
Super geniuses who leave a mark on human history which cannot be erased are few and far between. Their number is still less. Here we are faced with another question. Is the fundamental need of human culture confined to the necessity for experts and specialists in the fields of politics and law, science and mathematics, engineering and mechanics, finance and economics, or does it also need men who can show men the right path, the way to God and salvation? <coughs> Other experts provide men with knowledge about all that is in this world and the manner by which to use it. Yet there must be someone to tell men the purpose of creation and the meaning of life itself. Who is man and why has he been created? Who has provided him with his abilities and resources and why? What are the goals of life and how can they be attained? That is the most essential need of man and unless he knows this he cannot erect the edifice of culture on sound foundations and cannot succeed in life here and in the hereafter. Our reasoning refuses to believe that God who has provided man with even the most trivial of his requirements would neglect to provide for this greatest and most vital need. In fact, it can never be so, and it is not so. While God produced men of distinction in the arts and the sciences, he has also raised men with deep vision, pure intuition, and the highest abilities to know and understand him. He himself revealed to them the way of goodliness and righteousness. He gave them knowledge concerning the goals of life. He taught them the values of morality and entrusted them with the duty of communicating God's revelation to other men so as to show them the right path. These men are prophets and messengers of God. The prophets are distinguished from others in human society by their special talents, their natural mental outlook and meaningful way of life, just as the other geniuses in the arts and sciences are distinct from other men. The genius in a man is its own advertisement and automatically persuades others to recognize it. When we listen to a born poet, we can immediately detect his special talent. If those who do not have this ability try their level best to gain poetic excellence, they cannot succeed. The same is true with a born speaker writer, leader, inventor. Every talent distinguishes itself by its remarkable ability and extraordinary achievements. Others cannot stand a match to it. And the same is true of a prophet. His mind grasps problems which defy other minds. He speaks and throws a rare light on subjects upon which no other can speak. He has insight into subtle and intricate questions that no other would have understood despite years of profound thinking and meditation. Reason accepts whatever he says, the heart feels its truth. The experiences and observations of things in this world all testify to the truth of every word that flows from his mouth. If we ourselves, however, try to produce the same or a similar result, nothing but failure meets us. His nature and character are so good and pure that in all affairs his attitude is that of truthfulness, straightforwardness and nobility. He never does or utters wrong, nor does he commit any evil. He always inspires virtue and righteousness and practices himself what he preaches to others. No incident of his life shows that his life is not in harmony with his ideal. Neither his word nor his deed is prompted by self-interest. He suffers for the good of others but never makes others suffer for his own good. His whole life is an example of truth, nobility, purity, high thinking. It is in fact the most exalted form of human living. His character is without blemish. The most minute scrutiny fails to reveal any flaw in his life. All these facts, all these qualities make it clear that he is the prophet of God and faith must be placed in him. When it becomes clear that a certain person is the true prophet of God, the natural result of this realization is that his verse should be accepted, his instructions followed and his orders obeyed. It is unreasonable to accept a man as God's true prophet 
and yet not believe in what he says or not follow what he ordains. Your acceptance of him as God's prophet means you have acknowledged that what he says is from God Almighty and that whatever he does is in accordance with God's will and pleasure. Now, disobedient to him is the disobedience of God and disobedient of God leads to nothing but ruin and devastation. Therefore, the very acceptance of the prophet makes it incumbent upon you to bow to his instructions and accept them without any hesitation whatsoever. You may not be able to fully grasp the wisdom and usefulness of this or that order, but the fact that an instruction came from the prophet is sufficient guarantee for its truth. There can be no room for doubt or suspicion. Your inability to understand it is no reason for its having a flaw or a defect. A common man's understanding is not flawless. It has its limitations and they cannot be ignored altogether. It is clear that one who does not have a thorough knowledge about a certain thing cannot understand its refinements. But such a person would be a fool to reject what an expert says, merely on the plea that he himself does not fully understand the expert. In every important worldly affair, an expert is needed for advice, and when you turn to the expert, you thereafter trust his advice and entirely depend upon it. You surrender your own right of judgment and follow him honorably. Every ordinary man cannot be a master in all arts and crafts of the world. The proper way for an average human being is to what he can and with respect to things he cannot do, to use all his wisdom and shrewdness in finding the proper man to guide and help him, and after finding such a man, to accept his advice and follow him. When you are sure that a certain person is the best man available for the job, you seek his advice and guidance and have complete trust in him. To interfere with him at every step and say, make me understand it before you proceed any further is obviously unnecessary. When you hire a lawyer for a legal case, you do not interfere with him at every term. Instead, you have faith in him and follow his advice. For your medical treatment, you go to the doctor and follow his instructions. You neither poke your nose in medical matters, nor test your skill in logic by debating with the doctor. This is the proper attitude in life. The same must be done in the case of religion. You need the knowledge of God. You need to know the system of life according to God's pleasure. And you possess no means for obtaining this knowledge. It is incumbent upon you, therefore, to look for a true prophet of God. You will have to use utmost care and intelligence in your search for him. And if you choose a wrong man for a true prophet, he will put you on the wrong tra track. If, however, after properly weighing all consideration, you decide without doubt that a certain person is really God's prophet, then you must trust him completely and obey all his instructions faithfully. Now it is clear that the right path for man is that and that alone, which the prophet declares to be so, and the correct way of life is the one which he indicates to be from God. One can easily understand then that to have faith in the prophet and to obey and follow him is absolutely necessary for all men, and that a man who puts aside the prophet's instructions and tries to carve out a way for himself, deviates from the right path and surely goes astray. In this matter, men are guilty of strange errors. There are men who admit the integrity and truthfulness of the prophet, but do not believe in him, nor do they follow him in the affairs of their life. Such men are not only unbelievers, but also behave in an arrogant and unnatural way. Not to follow the prophet after admitting him to be a true means that one knowingly follows untruth. And what foolishness can be greater than this? Some people declare, We do not need a prophet for our guidance and we can find the way to truth ourselves. This too is a faulty view. You have probably studied geometry and you know that between two points there can only be one straight line. All other lines are crooked 
or will fail to reach the point in question. The same goes with the way to truth, which in the language of Islam is called the straight path. This path begins from man and goes straight towards God. This path can obviously be one and only one. All other parts would constitute aberrations and would lead astray. This straight part has been illustrated by the Prophet, and there is and can be no straight path besides it. The man who ignores it and seeks other ways is a victim of his imagination. He chooses a way and imagines it to be right, but soon finds himself entangled and is lost in the maze created by his fancy. What would you think of person who has lost his way and when a good man shows him the right one, ignores the guidance and declares, I will not take your guidance nor accept the way you have shown me, but I will grope in this unknown region and try to reach the objective of my search in my own way. In the presence of clear guidance from the prophets, this is sheer stupidity. If everyone tried to start up again by developing a system of divine guidance from scratch, it would simply be a gross waste of time and energy. We never do this in the field of science or the arts. Why do it here? This is a common error and a ref little reflection will reveal its flaws and weaknesses. If you think about this seriously, you will notice that a person who refuses to believe in the true prophet cannot find any way, straight or otherwise, of reaching God. This is because a man who refuses to believe in the advice of a truthful man adopts such a perverse attitude that the prospects for truth become estranged from him. He becomes a victim of his own obstinacy, arrogance, bias and perversity. Often his denial of truth is simply due to arrogance or a blind will to avoid change. It may be due to a stubborn desire to adhere to the way of the forefathers or slavery to the lower desires whose gratification becomes impossible with obedience to the teachings of the prophets. If a man is engrossed in any of the above conditions, the path to truth becomes close to him. Like a jaundiced person, he cannot look upon things in the uncurred light of reality. Such a person cannot discover any road to salvation. But if a man is sincere and truth-loving, if he is not a slave to any of the above conditions, the road to reality stretches out before him. There are absolutely no grounds for him to refuse to believe in the Prophet and to follow him. In fact, he finds in the teachings of the Prophet the very echo of his soul and discovers himself by discovering the Prophet. Above all, the true Prophet is raised by God himself. It is he who sent him to mankind to convey his message to the people. It is his command for man to have faith in the Prophet and follow him. Thus one who refuses to believe in God's messenger actually refuses to follow God's commandments and becomes a rebel. There is no denying that one who refuses to acknowledge the authority of the deputy of a sovereign actually refuses the authority of the sovereign himself. This disobedience turns him into a rebel. God is the Lord of the universe, the true sovereign, the king of kings, and it is the absolute duty of every man to acknowledge the authority of his messengers and apostles. Man must ob obey them as his accredited prophets, and one who turns away from the prophet of God is surely a triant, be he a believer in God or a disbeliever. Brief History of Prophethood Let us glance at the history of prophethood. Let us see how this long chain began, how it gradually unfolded and finally culminated in the prophethood of the last of the prophets, Muhammad, peace be upon him. The human race began from one man, Adam. It was from him that the family of man grew and the human race multiplied. All human beings born in this world have descended from the earliest pair, Adam and Eve. History and religion agree on this point. Even scientific investigation on the origin of man does not show that originally different men came into existence simultaneously or at different points in time and in different parts of the world. Most scientists in fact theorize that one man was brought into existence first and the entire human race probably descended from the, that same one man. Adam, the first man on earth, was also appointed as the prophet of God. God revealed his religion Islam to him and told him to convey and communicate it to his descendants. He was to teach them that God is one, 
the creator the sustainer of the world and that he is the lord of the universe to be worshiped alone and obeyed he was to make it clear that to him they will have to return one day and to him alone they should appeal for help that they should live good pious and righteous lives in accordance with god's pleasure if they did this they would be blessed by god with immense rewards if they turned away and disobeyed him they would be losers here and in the hereafter and would be severely punished for their disbelief and disobedience the descendants of adam who were good walked the right path shown to them those who were bad abandoned their father's teachings and gradually drifted into devious ways some began to worship the sun the moon and the stars other worship trees animals rivers some believed the air the water fire health and other forces of nature were each under the control of a different god and that each god should be pacified by means of worship in this way ignorance gave rise to many forms of polytheism and idolatry and scores of religions were created this was the age when adam's offspring spread over the globe and formed many different races and nations each nation made a different religion for itself each with practices and rituals of its own god the one master and creator of mankind and the universe was altogether forgotten not only that but adam's descendant forgot even the way of life which god had revealed to them and which their great father had taught them instead they followed their own desires every kind of evil custom grew and all sorts of ignorant ideas spread among the people they began to err in distinguishing right from wrong many evils were considered proper while many right things were not only ignored but dubbed as wrong at this stage god began to raise prophets from among every people each prophet reminded his people of the lesson they had forgotten they taught the worship of one god but an end put an end to idol worship and to practice of associating other gods with god all customs of ignorance were removed by them and the people were taught the right way of living the one which would bring them the pleasure of almighty god pure and godly laws were given to them and they were followed and enforced in every society god's two prophets were raised in every country in every land and among every people they all possess the same religion the religion of islam no doubt the methods of teaching and the legal system of each prophet differ slightly according to the needs of the people or according to the stage which the culture of the people had reached at that time the particular teachings of each prophet were determined by the kinds of evil he faced and sought to eradicate the methods of reform differed to fight different notions and ideas when people were in primitive stages of society civilization and intellectual development their rules and laws were simple these laws were modified and improved as the society evolved and progressed these differences however were obvious and their importance was superficial the fundamental teachings of all the religions were the same belief in the oneness of god adherence to a life of goodness and peace and belief in life after that with its just mechanism for reward and punishment man's attitude towards god's prophet has been curious first he mistreated the prophets and refused to listen or accept their teachings some prophets were expelled from their homelands while some others were killed others faced by the prophets indifference others faced by the people's indifference continued to preach their entire lives and won only a few followers in the midst of harassing opposition ridicule and resentment these prophets never ceased to preach the foolish and erroneous ways of the people the result of centuries of persistent in deviation ignorance and wrongdoing now took another form though the people accepted and practiced their teachings while the prophets were alive 
they began to introduce after the prophet's death distorted concepts of their past they included these distorted and senseless ideas into their religions and altered the prophet's teachings the pure source of knowledge of god most high was now polluted by their ignorance novel methods for worshiping god were developed some even determined to worship their prophets as gods like uh, some buddhist or christians do some made their prophets the sons of god while others associated their messengers with god in his divinity like some hindus in short the various behaviors of men in this respect were a travesty for all reason and a mockery of himself he made idols of those very persons who mission it had been to smash the idols to pieces by intermingling religion customs foolish rituals baseless and false stories legends and man-made laws man changed and perverted the teachings of the prophets so much that after a lapse of centuries confusion arose as to what was real and what was fictitious the teachings of the prophets were lost in a maze of fictions and perversities so that it became impossible to distinguish the wheat from the chaff not content with corrupting the prophets teachings they further ascribed false tales and derogatory t- traditions to the lives of the prophets and so the prophet's life history became so polluted that the true and reliable account of their lives became impossible to discern despite these corruptions the work of the prophets has not been totally in vain among all nations in spite of corruptions and alterations some traces of truth have survived the idea of god and the life after death was assimilated in some form or another a few principles of goodness truthfulness and morality were commonly observed throughout the world the prophets thus prepared the minds of the people for the safe introduction of a universal religion a religion which is fully in agreement with the nature of man they prepared man's mind for that universal religion which embodies all that was good in all other creeds and societies and which is acceptable to the entire human race as we have said above in the beginning separate prophets used to prepare appear among different nations or groups of people the teachings of each prophet were meant specifically for his people the reason was that at that stage of history nations were situated separately and were so cut off from each other that people were isolated within the geographical limits of their territories also facilities for intercommunication were non-existent under these circumstances it was very difficult to propagate a common world faith with its accompanying system of law for the way we should live in this world besides the general conditions of the early nations differed widely from one another their ignorance was great and the different peoples developed various forms of moral deviations so it was necessary that different prophets be raised to preach the truth to them and win them over to god's way it was necessary for them to gradually eradicate evils and deviations to root out the ways of ignorance and teach them to practice the noblest principles of a simple and righteous life in this endeavor they would ultimately train and bring them up in the skills and trades of life god alone knows how many thousands of years were spent in educating man in this manner and in developing him mentally morally and spiritually man continued to make progress and at last the time came when he emerged from his infancy and entered the age of maturity with progress and the spread of trade industry and arts communication was established between nations from china and japan to the distant reaches of europe and africa routes were opened by both land and sea many learned the art of writing and knowledge spread ideas began to be communicated from one country to another and learning and scholarship began to be exchanged great conquerors appeared extended their conquests far and wide and established vast empires they knit together many different nations under one political system thus nations came closer and their differences diminished it became possible under these circumstances 
for one system presenting a comprehensive life to be sent. The conditions demanded that a system catering to the moral, spiritual, social, cultural, political, economic and all other needs of men, one containing both religious and secular elements, be sent by the all-knowing God, and that this system be sent for all mankind. More than 2000 years ago, mankind attained a mental status which indicated that it ca ca craved a universal religion. Buddhism, though consisting of only a few moral principles and not a complete system of life, emerged from India and spread as far as Japan and Mongolia, at one end of the earth and Afghanistan and Russia at the other. Its missionaries travelled far and wide through the world. A few centuries later, Christianity appeared. Although the religion taught by Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was none but Islam, his followers reduced it to a religion called Christianity. And even this well-known religion spread to the far reaches of Persia and Asia, minor, and into the distant lands of Europe and Africa. One can clearly conclude, then, that the conditions of mankind at that time demanded a common religion for the whole human race. In fact, they were so prepared for it that when they found no complete and true religion in existence, they began to propagate the prevalent religions, no matter how defective, incomplete or unsatisfying they were. At such a crucial stage of civilization, when man's mind was craving for a world religion, a prophet was raised in Arabia. The religion he was given to propagate was again Islam. But now in the form of a complete, full-fledged system covering all aspects of individual and material life. He was made a prophet for the entire human race and was deputed to propagate his mission to the whole world. He was Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, peace be upon him. The prophethood of Muhammad. If we look at the world, alas, we find that no other country could have been more suitable for the much needed world religion than Arabia. It is located squarely in the middle of Asia and Africa, and Europe is not far away. At the time of Muhammad's appearance, the central part of Europe was inhabited by civilized and culturally advanced nations. Thus, these people lived at about the same distance from Arabia as did the people of India. This fact gave Arabia a central position. Look at the history of their era. You will find that no other people were more suited to be given his prophethood than the Arabs. Great nations of the world were struggling hard to gain world supremacy, and in this long and ceaseless struggle, they exhausted all their resources and vitality. The Arabs were a fresh and virile people. So-called social progress had produced bad habits among the advanced nations, while among the Arabs no such social organization existed. They were therefore free from the inactivity, debasement and indulgence that luxury and sensual satiety lead to. The pagan Arabs of the 5th century had not been affected by the evil influence of the artificial social systems and civilizations of the great nations of the world. They possessed all the good human qualities which a people untouched by the social progress of the time ought to possess. They were brave, fearless, generous and were faithful to their promises. Lovers of freedom, they were politically independent, not being subject to the jurisdiction of any of the imperial powers. They lived a simple life and were strangers to the life of luxury and indulgence. No doubt, there were certain undesirable aspects of their lives as well, as we shall mention later on. But the reason for the existence of these aspects was that for thousands of years no prophet had risen among them, nor had there appeared a reformer who might have civilized them and purged their life of all evil impurities. Centuries of independent life in sandy deserts had bred and nourished extreme ignorance among them. They had become so hard-hearted and firm in their ignorant traditions that to make them human again was not the task of an ordinary man. However, they did possess the capacity that, if some person of extraordinary powers were to invite them to reform and gave them a noble goal to reach, 
and a complete program by which to reach it, they would accept his call. They would rarely rise to act for the achievement of such a goal and spare no suffering or sacrifice in the cause. They would even be prepared to face, without the least hesitation, the hostility of the entire world in the cause of their mission. And clearly it was such a young, forceful and virile people that was needed for propagating the teachings of the world prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And now look at the Arabic language. If you study it and probe deeply into its literature, you will be convinced that there is no language other than Arabic which is more suited to give expression to high ideals, to explain the most delicate and intricate issues of divine knowledge. No language other than Arabic could so effectively impress the heart of man and mold it into submission to God. Small phrases and brief sentences express a world of ideas and at the same time are so forceful that they steal into the depths of the heart. Their very sound moves man to tears and ecstasy. They are so sweet that it feels as if honey were being poured into the ears. So full of harmony are they that every tissue of the listener's body is moved by their symphony. It is such a rich and powerful language that was needed for the Quran, the great word of God. It was therefore a demonstration of the great wisdom of Almighty God that he chose the land of Arabia for the birthplace of the world prophet. Let us now see how unique and extraordinary was the blessed personality chosen by God for this mission. Muhammad's Prophethood A Rational Vindication If one were to close one's eye and imagine oneself in the world of 1400 years ago, one would find that it was a world completely different from the one we live in. He would not find the slightest resemblance to the environment we find ourselves in today. How few and far between the opportunities for the exchange of ideas. How limited and primitive the means of communication. How minute and meager was man's knowledge and how narrow his outlook. How enveloped was he in superstition and how uncivilized and uncouth his thinking. Darkness held sway. There was only a faint glimmer of learning which could hardly brighten the horizon of human knowledge. There was no radios, no telephones, no televisions or cinemas. Railroads, automobiles and airplanes were undreamt of and printing presses and publishing houses were unknown. Handwritten books and their copies alone supplied whatever scanty literary material existed. Education was regarded as a luxury meant only for the most fortunate and educational institutions were few and far between. The store of human knowledge was scanty, man's outlook was narrow, and his ideas concerning life were confined to his limited surroundings. Even a scholar of that age lacked in certain respects the knowledge possessed by a layman of today, and the most cultured person was less refined than our own man in the street. Indeed, humanity was steeped in the extremes of ignorance and superstition. Whatever light of learning there was seemed to be fighting a losing battle against the darkness which prevailed all around. <coughs> what are considered to be matters of common knowledge today could hardly be acquired then, even after years of intense thought and research. Things which we now classify as myth and superstition were then regarded as unquestionable truths. Acts which we now deem savage and barbarous were for them the order of the day. Methods which we would now clearly recognize as repulsive and degrading were the very soul of their morality, and people could not imagine in those days that there could be a different way of life. Skepticism had reached such mighty proportions that people refused to consider anything as lofty and sublime unless it appeared in the form of the supernatural the extraordinary, the uncanny, and even the illogical. They developed such a distorted mentality that they could never imagine a human being to possess a godly soul, nor the same to be human. Arabia, the abyss of darkness. In that era of ignorance, there was a country where darkness lay even thicker. 
the neighboring countries of Persia, Byzantium, and Egypt possessed at least a glimmer of civilization and a faint light of learning. But Arabia could receive no share of their cultural influences. It stood isolated, cut off by vast oceans of sand. Arab traders plodded great distances for months at a time just to carry their goods to and from these countries. They could hardly acquire any bits of knowledge on their journeys. In their country, there was not a single educational institution. There were no libraries and books were rare treasures. No one seemed interested in the production and advancement of knowledge. The few who could read were not educated enough to be in any way involved with the existing arts and sciences. They did possess a highly developed language, which was capable of expressing the finest qualities of human thought in a remarkable ram manner. Their literary taste was also of a high degree, but a study of the remnants of their literature reveals how limited was their knowledge, hollow were their standards of culture and civilization, how saturated their minds with superstitions, how barbarous and ferocious their thoughts and customs, and how uncouth and degraded their conceptions of morality. It was a country without a government. Every tribe claimed authority and considered itself to an independent unit. In fact, there was no law except the law of the jungle. Loot, arson and murder of the innocent and the weak were the order of the day. Life, property and honor were constantly at stake. Different tribes were always at drawn swords against one another. Any trivial incident was enough to cause a war, to burst out in ferocious fury which sometimes even developed into a county-wide conflict lasting for several decades. Whatever notions they had of morals, culture and civilization were primitive and uncouth. They could hardly discriminate between pure and impure, lawful and unlawful, civil and uncivil. Their life was wild. Their methods were barbaric. They took pleasure in ad adultery gambling and drinking, loot and plunder was their motto, murder and raping their habits. They would stand stark naked before each other without any qualms of conscience. Even their women would be naked at the ceremony of going around the mosque in Makkah. Out of sheer foolish notions of prestige, they would bury their daughters alive lest anyone should become their son-in-law. They would marry their stepmothers after the death of their fathers. They were even ignorant in elements of everyday routine such as eating, dressing and washing. Concerning their religious beliefs, they suffered from the same evils which were playing havoc with the rest of the world. They worshipped stones, trees, idols, stars and spirits. In short, everything conceivable except God. They did not know anything about the teachings of the prophets of old. They understood that Abraham and Ismail were their forefathers, but they knew next to nothing about their religious teachings or about the God whom these prophets worshipped. The stories of Ad and Thamud were found in their folklore, but they contained no traces of the teachings of prophets Hud and Saleh. The Jews and Christians transmitted certain legendary folk tales to them about the Israelite prophets. However, these stories presented a terrible picture of those noble souls. They adulterated their teachings with figments of their imagination and tarred their lives black. Indeed, the picture presented in these traditions about the institution of prophethood and the character of the Israelite prophets is exactly the opposite of all that these noble followers of truth stood for. The Saviour is born. In such a dark age and in such an ignorant country, a man was born. In his early childhood, his parents died. He was left with his grandfather who a few years later died as well. Consequently, he was deprived of even the scant training and upbringing which an Arab child normally received. In his boyhood, he tended flocks of sheep and goats in the presence of Bedo and youth. When he was old enough, he became a businessman. All his associations and dealings were with the Arabs alone, whose sorry state has just been described. Education had not even touched him. He was completely unlettered and unschooled. He could neither read nor write, and he never had the chance to sit in the company of learned men, for such men were non-existent in Arabia at that time. He did have a few opportunities to go out of his country, but those journeys were business trips undertaken by Arab trade caravans. If he met any learned man or had the occasion to observe any aspects of culture and civilization, 
those random meetings and stray observations could not be given any place in the making of his personality. Such things can never have so profound an influence on anyone as to lift him totally out of his environment so that he has no similarity with it. They can never transform him completely and raise him to such heights of originality and glory that there remains no likeness between him and the society in which he is born. Nor can they be the manner by which such profound and vast knowledge is acquired, which would transform the unlettered Bedouin into a leader not only for that age, but for the world at large and for all ages to come. <laughs> Indeed, whatever the intellectual and cultural influence these journeys may have exerted on him, the fact remains that they could in no way impart to him those conceptions and principles of religion, ethics, culture and civilization which were totally non-existent in the world at that time, and they could not have created that sublime and perfect pattern of human character which was then nowhere to be found a diamond in a heap of stones. We can now look at the life and work of this noble man in the context not only of Arabian society but also of the entire world as it stood then. He is entirely different from the people among whom he is born and with whom he spends his youth and early manhood. He never tells a lie. The whole nation is unanimous in testifying to his truthfulness. Even his worst enemies never accuse him of telling a lie on any occasion whatsoever during his entire lives. He talks politely and never uses obscene and abusive language. He has such a charming personality and winsome manners that he captivates the hearts of those who come into contact with him. In his dealings with people, he always follows the principles of justice and fair play. He remains engaged in business and trade for years but he never enters into any dishonest transaction. Those who deal with him in business have full confidence in his integrity. The entire nation calls him the truthful and the trustworthy. Even his enemies deposit their costly belongings with him for safe custody, and he equitably fulfills this trust. He is the very embodiment of modesty in the midst of a society which is immodest to the core. Born and bred among a people who regard drunkenness and gambling as virtues, he never touches alcohol and never indulges in gambling. His people are uncouth, uncultured and unclean. But personified in him is the highest culture and the most refined aesthetic look. Outlook. Surrounded on all sides by heartless people, he himself has a heart overflowing with the milk of human kindness. He helps the orphans and the widows. He is hospitable to travelers. He harms no one. Instead, he goes all out to suffer hardships for others' sake. Living among those for whom war is bread and butter, he is such a lover of peace that it has melt for the people when they take up arms and cut each other's throats. He keeps aloof from the feuds of his tribe and is foremost in bringing about reconciliation. Brought up in an idolatrous society, he is so clear-minded and possesses such a pure soul that he regards nothing in the heavens and the earth worthy of worship except the one true God. He does not bow before any created thing and does not partake in the offerings made to idols and refuse to do so even in his childhood. Instinctively, he hates all worship of any creature besides God. In brief, the towering and radiant personality of this man in the midst of such a corrupted and dark environment may be likened to a beacon light brightening a pitch dark night or to a diamond in a heap of dead stones. A revolution comes. After spending his life in such chaste, pure and civilized manner, there comes a revolution in his being. He varies of the darkness and ignorance, corruption, immorality, idolatry and disorder which surround him on all sides. He finds everything around him out of harmony with his soul. He retires to the hills, away from the humdrum of society. He spends days and nights in perfect seclusion and meditation. He fasts so that his soul and heart may become purer and nobler still. He thinks and ponders deep. He is in search of the light which might melt away the surrounding darkness. He wants to get hold of that power with which he might bring about the downfall of the corrupt and disorderly world and lay the foundations of a new and better one. Lo, a remarkable revolution overcomes his person. All of a sudden, 
His heart is illuminated with the divine light, giving him the power he had yearned for. He comes out of the confinement of his cave, goes to the people and addresses them in the following strain. The idols which you worship are a mere sham. Cease to worship them from now onward. No mortal being, no star, no tree, no stone, no spirit is worthy of human worship. Therefore, bow not your heads in worship before them. The entire universe with everything that it contains belongs to God Almighty alone. He alone is the creator, the nourisher, the sustainer and consequently the real sovereign before whom all should bow down and to whom all should pray and render obedience. Thus, worship him alone and obey only his commands. Loot and plunder, murder and rape, injustice and cruelty, all the vices in which you indulge are crimes in the eyes of God. Leave your evil ways. He aids them all. Speak the truth. Be just. Do not kill anyone. Do not rob anyone. Take your lawful share. Give what is due to others in a just manner. You are human beings and all human beings are equal in the eyes of God. None is born with a slur of shame on his face, nor has anyone come into the world with a mantle of honor hung around his neck. He alone is high and honored, who is God-fearing and pious, true in words and deeds. Distinctions of birth and glory of race are no measure of greatness and honor. One who fears God and does good deeds is the noblest of human beings. One who has no love for Almighty God and is steeped in bad manners is doomed. There is an appointed day after your death when you shall have to appear before your Lord. You shall be called to account for all your deeds, good or bad, and you shall not be able to then to hide anything. The whole record of your life shall be an open book to him. Your fate shall be determined by your good or bad actions. In the court of the true judge, the all-seeing and knowing God, the question of unfair recommendation and favoritism does not arise. You shall not be able to bribe him. No consideration will be given to your family, status or history. True faith and good deeds alone will put you in good standing at that time. He who will be fully equipped with them shall take his abode in the heaven of eternal happiness, while one divide of them shall be cast in the fire of hell. This is the message with which he comes. The ignorant nation turns against him, abuses and stones are showered at his august person. Every conceivable torture and cruelty is perpetrated upon him, and this continues not for a day or two, but ceaselessly for thirteen long, troublesome years. At last he is exiled, but he is not given respite from persecution even then. He is tormented in various ways in his home of refuge. The whole of Arabia is incited against him. He is persecuted and hounded down continuously for eight more years. He suffers it all, but does not budge an inch from the stand he has taken. He is resolute, firm and inflexible in his stance and purpose. Why all the hostility? One might inquire, why did his nation become his own enemy? Was there any dispute about gold and silver or any other worldly possession? Was his due to any blood feud? Did he ask for anything from them? No. All this hostility was based on the fact that he asked them to worship the one true God and to lead a life of righteousness, purity and goodness. He preached against idolatry told them not to worship other beings besides God and denounced their wrong ways of living. He cut the, at the roots of priest craft. He spoke against the distinctions of high and low between human beings and condemned the prejudices of tribe and race as sheer ignorance. He wanted to change the whole structure of society, which had been handed down to them from time immemorial. In their turn, his countrymen told him that the principles of his mission were hostile to their ancestral traditions and asked him either to give them up or bear the worst consequences. One might ask, for what reasons did he suffer all these hardships? His nation offered to accept him as their king, and to lay all the riches of the land at his feet if only he would leave the preaching of his religion and the spreading of his message. But he chose to refuse their tempting offers and to suffer for his cause instead. Why? Was he to gain in any way if those people changed their lives and became godly and righteous? Why was it that he cared not a bit for riches and luxury, kingship and glory and ease and plenty? 
Was he playing for some higher material gains so that these blessings sank into insignificance in comparison with them? Were those gains so tempting that he could elect to go through fire and sore and bear tortures of the soul and torments of the body with unwavering composure for years? One has to ponder this deeply to find an answer. Can anyone ever imagine a higher example of self-sacrifice, brotherliness and kind-heartedness towards his fellow beings than that a man would ruin his happiness for the good of others? While those very people for whose betterment he is striving should stone them, abuse them, banish him and give him no quarter even in his exile, and that, in spite of all this, he should refuse to stop working for their well-being. Can any sincere person undergo so much suffering for a false cause? Can any dishonest speculator or visionary exhibit such firmness and determination for his ideal as to stick to his gun to the very last and remain unruffled in the face of dangers and tortures of every type when a whole country rises up in our arms against him? This faith, this firm commitment and this resolution with which he led his movement to ultimate success is therefore clear proof of the supreme truth of his cause. Had there been even the slightest doubt and uncertainty in his heart, he could never have braved the storm which continued in all its fury for twenty-one long years. This is one side of the revolution brought in his being. The other is even more wonderful and remarkable. A changed man at forty? Why? For forty years he lived as an Arab among Arabs. In all that time he was not known as a statesman, a preacher or an orator. None heard him imparting gems of wisdom and knowledge as he began to do afterwards. He was never seen discussing the principles of metaphysics, ethics, law, politics, economics and sociology. Not to speak of being a great general. He was not even known as an ordinary soldier. He uttered no word about God the angels, the revealed books, the early prophets, the bygone nations, the day of judgment, the life after death, heaven and hell. No doubt he possessed an excellent character and charming manners and was highly cultured. Yet there was nothing so deeply striking and so radically extraordinary in him which could make men expect something great and revolutionary from him in the future. He was known among people as a quiet, calm, gentle, law-abiding citizen of good nature. But when he came out of the cave with a new message, he was completely transformed. When he began preaching his message, all of Arabia stood in awe and wonder and was bewitched by his wonderful eloquence and oratory. It was so impressive and captivating that his worst enemies were afraid of hearing it, lest it should penetrate deep into the recesses of their hearts and carry them off their feet making them forsake their old religion and culture. It was so matchless that the whole legion of Arab poets, preachers and speakers of the highest caliber failed to bring forth its equivalent. They failed to equal it even when he challenged his opponents to put their heads together and produce one single line like those he recited. <laughs> his all-embracing message. Now he appeared before his people as a unique philosopher a wonderful reformer and a renowned shaper of culture and civilization. He came before them as an industrious politician, a great leader, a judge of the highest eminence and an incomparable general. This unlettered Bedouin, this deviler of the desert, spoke with wisdom the like of which none had uttered before and none could utter after. He delivered speeches on the principles of the decline and and fall of nations and empires, supporting his thesis with historical data from the past. He reviewed the achievements of the reformers of old, passed judgments on the various religions and gave verdicts on the differences and disputes between nations. He taught laws of ethics and principles of culture. He presented such laws of culture, economics, group conduct and international relations that even eminent thinkers and scholars can grasp their true wisdom only after lifelong research and experience. Their beauties, indeed, continue to unfold as man advances in theoretical knowledge and practical experience. This silent and peace-loving trader, who had never before handled a sword, who had no military training, who had but once participated in a ball battle, and that too just as a spectator, 
turned into such a brave soldier that he did not retreat even once in the fiercest of battles. He became such a great general that he conquered the entire Arabian Peninsula in nine years, at a time when the weapons were primitive and the means of communication poor indeed. His military skill and proficiency developed to such a degree, and the military spirit and training he instilled in a motley crowd of Arabs who had no equipment worthy of the name, wrought such a miracle that within a few years they overthrew the two most formidable military powers of the day and became the masters of the known world. This reserved and quiet man, who for a full forty years never gave any indication of political interest or activity, suddenly appeared on the stage of the world as such a great political reformer and statesman that without the aid of radio, telephone and press, he brought together the scattered inhabitants of a desert extending across 1,200,000 square miles. He joined together a people who were warlike, ignorant, unruly, uncultured, and plunged in self-destructive trivial warfare under one banner, one law, one religion, one culture, one civilization, and one form of government. He changed their ways of thinking, their very habits and morals. He turned the uncouth into the culture, the barbarous into the civilized, the evil doers and bad characters into God-fearing and righteous persons. Their unruling and stiff-necked natures were transformed into models of obedience of law and order. A nation which for centuries had produced not one single great man worthy of that name now gave birth under his influence and guidance to thousands of noble souls who were to travel to far off corners of the earth to preach and teach the principles of religion morality and civilization he accomplished this feat not through any lure oppression or cruelty but by his captivating manner his winsome personality and the conviction of his teachings with his noble and gentle behavior he befriended even his enemies he captured the hearts of the people with his boundless sympathy and human kindness he ruled justly he did not soar from truth and righteousness he did not oppress even his deadly enemies, men who had sworn to kill him, who pelted him with stones, who turned him out of his homeland, who pitched the whole of Arabia against him. Nay, not even those who chewed the raw liver of his dead uncle in a frenzy of vengeance. He forgave them all when he triumphed over them. He never took revenge on anyone for his personal grievances. He never retaliated against anyone for the wrongs perpetrated on him. Despite the fact that he became the ruler of his country, he cared so little about himself and was so modest that he remained very simple and sparing in his habits. He lived poorly as before in his humble thatched mud cottage. He slept on a bare mattress, wore coarse clothes, ate the simplest food, and sometimes went without food at all. He used to spend entire nights standing in prayer before his master. He came to the rescue of the destitute and the penniless. He felt not the least reservation in working as a laborer. To his last moments there was not the slightest tinge of kingly pomp and show of the arrogance of the mighty and the rich in him. Like an ordinary man, he would sit and walk with the people and share their joys and sorrows. He would so mix and mingle with the crowd that the stranger, an outsider, would find it difficult to point out the leader of the people and ruler of the nation from the rest of the company. Despite his greatness, his behavior with the meekest person was that of a simple, ordinary man. Throughout his life, he did not seek any reward or profit for himself, nor did he leave any property for his heirs. He dedicated his soul to his people. He did not ask his followers to earmark anything for himself or his descendants, so much so that he forbade his relatives from receiving the benefit of zakat, lest his followers at any future time hand out the whole share of it to them. His contribution to human thought. The achievement of this great man do not end here. In order to arrive at a correct appraisal of his true worth, one must look at him against the backdrop of the history of the world as a whole. Such an appraisal would reveal that this unlettered dweller of the Arabian desert, who was born in the Dark Ages over 1400 years ago, was the real pioneer of the modern age and the true leader of humanity. He is not only the leader of those who accept his leadership, but also of those who do not acclaim him as such. He is even the leader of those who denounce him the, o 
the only difference being that they are unaware of the fact that his guidance is still impercept imperceptibly influencing their thoughts and actions, and is the governing principle of their lives and the very spirit of modern times. It was he who turned the course of human thought away from superstition, the unnatural and the unexplainable, towards a logical approach, illustrating a love for truth and a balanced worldly life. It was he who, in a world which regarded only supernatural events as miracles and demanded their occurrence to verify the truth of a religious mission, inspired the urge for rational proof as a criterion for truth. It was he who opened the eyes of those who before him had been accustomed to look for signs of God only in natural phenomena. It was he who, in the place of baseless speculation, led men to use logic and reasoning on the basis of observation, experimentation and research. It was, he was the one who clearly defined the limits and functions of sense perception, reason and intuition. It was he who brought about a union between the values of the spirit and those of the material. It was he who harmonized faith, knowledge and action, joining scientific spirit with the power of religion. He was the first to unite the disciplines for the establishment of a better and more prosperous world. He was the one who completely eradicated idolatry, man worship and the worship of many gods, replacing them with belief in one god. He was so thorough in this that even those religions which were based entirely on superstitions and idolatry were compelled to adopt a monotheistic team. It was he who revolutionized the basic concepts of ethics and spirituality to those who believed that asceticism and self-annihilation alone formed the standard of moral and spiritual purity, who believed that purity could not be achieved except by running away from life, disregarding the urges of the flesh and subjecting the body to all kinds of torture. He showed that spiritual evolution and salvation are attained through active participation in the practical affairs of this world. It was he who showed man his true worth and position. Those who acknowledge only a God incarnate or, or a Son of God as their spiritual guide were told that human beings like themselves do not claim to be gods, can become the representative of God on earth. Those who proclaim kings and tyrants or other powerful individuals as their gods were made to understand that their false lords were mere ordinary human beings and nothing more. It was he who stressed that no man can claim holiness, authority, or kingship as his birthright, that no one born with the brand of untouchability, slavery, or serfdom. He was the one whose example and teachings inspired the thoughts of the oneness of mankind, the quality of the human race, the concepts of true democracy and real freedom in the world. In practical life, the results irreversibly impressed upon the laws and ways of the world through the leadership of this illiterate person are countless. So many principles of culture, civilization, good behavior and pure thinking prevalent in the world today owe their origin to him. The social laws he initiated have infiltrated deep into the structure of human social life. And this process continues to this day. The economic principles he taught stimulated many movements in world history and hold out the same promises for the future. The laws of government he constructed revolutionized many of the political theories of the world and continued to project their influence on the administration of justice in the courts of nations. They form a perpetual source of guidance for all legislators and for all times to come. This unlettered Arab was the person who, for the first time, erected the whole framework of international relations. He regulated the laws for war and peace. No one previously had even remotely entertained the notion that there could be an ethical code of war and that relations between different nations could be regulated on a common ground for the good of all mankind. The Greatest Revolutionary In the cavalcade of world history, the sublime figure of this wonderful person towers so high above all the great men of all times that they appear to be dwarfs when contrasted to him. Those who were famous as heroes of nations cannot be compared to him. None of them possessed a genius capable of making a deep impression on more than one or two aspects of life. Some are the exponents of theories and ideas but are deficient in practical action. Others are men of action but suffer from lack of knowledge. Some are renowned as statesmen only. 
others are masters of strategy and maneuvering some concentrated on one aspect of life in such a way that other aspects were overlooked some devoted their energies to ethical and spiritual values but ignored economics and politics others concentrated on economics and politics but neglected the spiritual side of life in short one comes across heroes who are experts in one walk of life only he is the only example where all the excellences are blended together into one personality he is a philosopher and a seer and a living example of what he teaches he is a great statesman as well as a military genius he is a legislator and also a teacher of morals he is the spiritual luminary as well as a religious guide his vision penetrates every aspect of life and there is nothing which he touches does not adorn his orders and commandments cover a vast field from the regulation of international relations to the habits of everyday life like eating drinking and cleanliness of the body on the foundation of his theories he established a civilization and developed a culture and here he produced such a fine equilibrium in the conflicting aspects of life that one cannot find even the slightest trace of any flaw or defect can any one point out any other example of such a perfect and all-round personality most feminine personalities are said to be products of their environment but his case is unique his environment seems to have played no part in the making of his personality it also cannot be proved that historically his birth synchronized with what was occurring in arabia at that time the most one can say is that the circumstances in arabia cried out for the appearance of a person who could weld together the warring tribes into one nation and lay the foundation of their economic solidarity and well-being by bringing other countries under their sway in short a national leader who had all the traits of an arab of those days a man who through cruelty oppression bloodshed deceit and hypocrisy or any other means fair or foul could have enriched his people conquered other nations and left a kingdom as a heritage for his successors one cannot prove any other crying need for the history of arabia at that time with respect to hegel's philosophy of history or marx's history historical materialism the most that can be said is that the time and the environment demanded the emergence of a leader who could create a nation and build an empire but hegel or marx's philosophy cannot explain how an environment such as this could produce a man whose mission was to teach the best of morals to purify humanity of all filth and to wipe out the prejudices and superstitions of the days of ignorance it cannot explain how a man could emerge from this environment who looked beyond the watertight compartments of race nation and culture it cannot tell us how this environment gave rise to men who laid the foundations of a moral spiritual and cultural superstructure for the good of the world and not for his country alone a man who practically not theoretically placed business transactions politics and international relations on moral grounds and produced such a balanced synthesis between worldly and spiritual life that even to this day it is considered a masterpiece of wisdom and foresight can any one honestly call such a person the product of the impenetrable darkness which saturated arabia not only does he appear to be independent of his environment when we look at his achievement achievements we are irresistibly drawn to the conclusion that he breaks through all temporary and physical barriers and passes through beyond centuries and millennia within his example is comprehended all human activity throughout the entire history of mankind he is not one of those whom history has cast into oblivion he is not praised simply for being a good leader in his own time he is that unique example of a maker of history one can scan the lives of great leaders of the world who brought about revolutions and one will find that on each occasion the forces of revolution were gathering momentum for the destined upheaval the forces were moving in certain directions and were only waiting for a favorable moment to burst forth by harnessing these forces in time for action the revolutionary leader played the part of an actor for whom the stage is already set while on the contrary amidst all makers of history and revolutionary figures of all times 
He is the only person who had to find ways and means to bring about the requirements of revolution. He alone had to mold and produce the kind of men he wanted for his purpose because the spirit of revolution and its necessary furnishings did not exist in the people among whom he lived. By his forceful personality, he made a permanent impression on the hearts of thousands of his disciples and molded them according to his liking. By his iron will, he prepared the gown for revolution, fashioned its shape and features, and directed the current of events into the channel he desired. Can anyone cite another example of a maker of history of such distinction, another revolutionary of such brilliance and splendor? The Final Testimony one may ponder over the ponder over the matter and wonder how, in the dark ages fourteen hundred years ago, and in a backward region like Arabia, an illiterate Arab trader and herdsman came to possess such light, such knowledge, such power, such talents, and such fine moral virtues. One could say that there is nothing peculiar about his message, that it is the product of his own mind. If it is so, then he should have proclaimed himself to be God. If he had made such an assertion, the peoples of the earth who did not hesitate to call Krishna and Buddha, gods and Jesus, the son of God, and who could without the least guilt worship even the forces of nature, would have readily acknowledged this wonderful person as the Lord God himself. But lo, his assertion is just the opposite one, for he proclaimed, I am a human being like yourselves. I have not brought anything to you of my own accord. It has all been revealed to me by God. Whatever I possess belongs to Him. This message, the like of which the whole of humanity is unable to produce, is the message of God. It is not the product of my own mind. Every word of it has been sent down by Him, and glory be to Him, whose message it is. All the wonderful achievements which stand to my credit in your eyes, all the laws I have given, all the principles I have spoken of, none of them is from me. I find myself totally incompetent, incapable of producing such things. I look to divine guidance in all matters, whatever he wills, I do. What he directs, I proclaim. What a wonderful, inspiring example of truth, honesty, honor, and integrity it is. A liar and a hypocrite tries to ascribe to himself all the credit for the works of others even when the falsehood of his claim can easily be proved. But this great man does not assign the credit for any of these achievements to himself. He assigns absolutely no credit to himself, even when none could be found to contradict him, as there was no way of finding out the source of his inspiration. What more proof of honesty of purpose, sincerity of character and sublimity of soul can there be? Who else can be more truthful than he who receives such unique gifts through a secret channel and still points out the source of his inspiration? The irresistible conclusion is that this man was the true messenger of God. Such was our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He was a man of extraordinary talents, a perfect example of purity and goodness, a symbol of truth and justice. He was a great apostle of God, his messenger to the entire world. His life and thought, his truth, honesty, the goodness of his character, his watch achievements, all stand so as undeniable proofs of his prophethood. Anyone who studies his life and teachings without bias will testify that without doubt he was the true prophet of God, and the Quran, the book he gave to mankind, is the true book of God. No unbiased and serious seeker of truth can escape this conclusion. It must also be clearly understood that through Muhammad alone we can now know the straight path of Islam. The Quran and the example of Muhammad are the only unreliable sources available for mankind to learn God's will in its totality. Muhammad is the messenger of God for the whole human race and the long chains of prophets came to an end with him. He was the last prophet and all the instructions God wished to give mankind through direct revelation, was sent by him through Muhammad. This revelation is enshrined in the Quran and the Sunnah. Whoever is a seeker of truth and is anxious to become an honest Muslim, a sincere follower of the way of God, must perforce believe in God's last prophet. 
he must accept his teachings and follow the way he pointed out to men. This is the real road to success and salvation, the finality of prophethood. This brings us to the question of the finality of prophethood. Let us now consider this in relation to the prophethood of Muhammad peace be upon him. We have already discussed the nature of prophethood and this discussion makes it clear that the advent of a prophet is not an everyday event nor is the presence in person of the prophet essential for every land, people or period. The life and teachings of the prophet are the beacon light to guide people to the right path. As long as his teachings and guidance are alive, he is as it were himself alive. The real death of a prophet consists not in his physical demise, but in the neglect of his teachings and the interpolation of his guidance. Earlier prophets have died only because their followers adulterated their teachings, altered their instructions and defiled their life examples by attaching false stories to them. Not one of the earlier books, the Torah of Moses, the Psalms of David, the Gospel of Jesus exists today in its original form. Even the followers of these books confess they do not possess the original books. The biographies of the earlier prophets are so mixed up with fiction that an accurate and authentic account of their lives have become impossible. Their lives have become tales and legends and no trustworthy record is available anywhere. <coughs> it cannot even be said with certainty when and where a given prophet was born, when and how he lived and what law he gave to mankind. The fact is, the real death of a prophet lies in the death of his teachings. Judging the facts on this standard, no one can deny that Muhammad and his teachings are alive. His teachings stand uncorrupted and are un incorruptible. The Quran, the book he gave to mankind, exists in its original form, without the slightest alteration of letter, syllable or word. The entire account of his life, his sayings, instruction and actions is preserved with complete accuracy. So great is his truth is this truth that even after the lapse of 14 centuries, its illustration in history is so clear and complete that it seems as if we are seeing him with our own very own eyes. The biography of no other human being is so well preserved as that of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Even the exact date and place of his birth is known with certainty. In every aspect of life, we can seek guidance from Muhammad and learn a lesson from his example. This is why there is no need for any other prophet after Muhammad, the last of the prophets. Peace be upon him. Furthermore, there are three things which require the advent of a new prophet. Merely the replacement of a departed prophet is not a good enough reason. These conditions can be summed up as follows. Number 1. That the teachings of all earlier prophets have been changed, corrupted or lost, and the revival is needed. In this case, a new prophet is raised so that he can purge the impurities from the people's life and restore the system of God to its original form. Or, number 2. That the teachings of a prophet who has died were incomplete, and it is necessary to amend them, improve on them, or add to them. So a new prophet is sent to bring about these improvements. Or, number three, that the earlier prophet was raised specifically for a certain nation or territory, and a prophet for another nation, people, or country might be required. These are the three fundamental conditions which require that a new prophet be raised up. A careful review of the facts show that none of these conditions exist today. The teachings of the last prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, are alive, have been fully preserved and are made immortal. The guidance he offered mankind is complete and flawless, a guidance which is enshrined in the Quran. As for the Quran, there is nothing more authentic in all of human history than this fact. It is the same Quran to the exact letter as the one revealed to Muhammad over 1400 years ago. All other sources of Islam are fully intact. This is so much the case that each instruction, every action of the Prophet can be ascertained without the least shadow of a doubt. Thus, since his teachings are wholly intact, there is no need for any new Prophet to appear. The role of a Prophet is accomplished by his example, what he says and does, how he acts and lives. 
if these teachings and actions are kept historically alive, it is as if he himself remained alive. Second, God Almighty has completed his revealed guidance through Prophet Muhammad for mankind. God Most Great says, Today I have perfected your religion for you and completed my bounty on you. And a thorough study of Islam as a complete system of life proves the truth of these Quranic words. Islam gives guidance for life in this world as well as preparation for our journey to the hereafter. Nothing essential for man's guidance has been left out. This system of life has now been perfected and there is no ground for new prophethood on the plea of imperfection. Last, the message of Muhammad peace be upon him was not meant for any particular people, place or period. He was sent as the world prophet, the messenger of truth for the whole of humanity. The Quran commanded Muhammad to declare, O mankind, I am God's messenger to all of you. The Quran calls him a blessing for all the peoples of the world. Without doubt, his approach was universal and humanitarian. This is why after him, there is no need for any new prophethood and the Quran describes Muhammad as the last in the chain of true prophets. Because of this, the only source of knowledge about God and his system of life is Muhammad, peace be upon him. We can understand Islam only through his teachings, which are so comprehensive that they can guide for all times to come. The world does not now need another new prophet. It only needs men who put all their faith in Muhammad, who become the standard bearers of his message, who propagate it to the world and seek to establish the culture which Muhammad gave to men. The world needs men of good character who can translate his teachings into practice and establish a society governed by divine law. It needs those men who work to establish this society, God's society, whose supremacy Muhammad came to establish. This is the mission of Muhammad and on its success hinges the success of men.